How did we get into this? I'm still scratching paint. What paint? <laughs> this is the most horsepower this thing's seen in about 40 years, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's not the truck show. Those guys are on later. It is their 1948 Chevy pickup, though. Oh, well, that's a beauty. Maybe you saw them give it the patina paint job, some upgraded suspension and steering. Now, it's an old work in progress. They've dubbed the Class 6. Of course, this is where we come in, the engine, which we'll first pull out for a little teardown. What is it? Well, a little piece of Chevy history here for you. It's a 235 inline six, considered to be a pretty durable, powerful engine in its day. Now they put them in 41 through 65 Chevys and trucks. The truck guys say they want a mild performance upgrade while keeping as many original parts as possible. Ed, with the 235 finally out of the truck, we're off and running on our first ever inline six project. This is obviously not the original engine because 54, the last two numbers on the right stand for the year, T stands for utility truck, Z could be either a utility truck or a school bus. Taking this 235 apart, it's like a little history lesson. Hey, check out the combination intake exhaust manifold this thing uses. And what's this? Well, it's a lever that used to be connected to a floor mounted starter button. Anyway, the teardown continues, and so far, the block appears to have plenty of life left. Nice and smooth. Cast iron crankshaft seems to be in pretty good shape, too. Of course, we won't know for sure till we take them to a local machine shop where they can also get refurbished. Groove's Engines has been around since 1967. First in the racing engine business, now it specializes in remanufactured motors and quality machine work on all kinds of engines. This is the engine that we built to be the street rod motor. Doug Anderson has been around for most of those years, and he's a big reason for the company's top-notch reputation. I think the first thing you gotta have is the right people. Yeah. You gotta have people who are car guys, and, and we work hard to find car guys, because they, they understand why we do what we do. You gotta have good equipment. While equipment and engines have changed with the times, Doug says the trusty old 350 is still the heart of their business. 350 Chevy is 300 horse stuff. It's so easy to make 300 horse today. In the old days, we struggled to make, you know. <laughs> yeah. And what, what we didn't know is it was all in the heads. Yeah. Everybody chased it in the bottom. Really? It was all in the top. Look at the intake ports. You got two ports feeding one valve. Doug knows his engines. He's a walking encyclopedia. For him, they're a source of lifelong passion. The nuances that we all take for granted fascinate me. All the little things that are going on in an engine that, that people overlook. I think it's just, you know, you pop the hood and there's just an engine underneath that stuff today. But the engine is, is doing incredible things every second of every day. He's been around more than a few Chevy 235s like the one we're bringing in for machine work today. It was called the stove bolt. And the reason it's a stove bolt because they used the same bolts they used to make stoves. It was also called the Blue Flame 6, by the way, and, well, Mike's just arrived with our 235 block, heads, and crank. The block and heads first visit the oven so they can bake at about 700 degrees. And we bake it to get all the hydrocarbons off. We got an afterburner that, that burns all the hydrocarbons, so it's, a, it's an environmentally sound process. It also gets all the rust and iron oxide out of the water jacket. We gotta let that happen for several hours, but we can still look at the other steps it'll go through in the process. We shot blast it with small steel shot to clean it thoroughly. We magna flux it to make sure there's no cracks anywhere in the block or layer on the heads. And then from there it goes to machining, so we... For the block, that means boring the cylinders, and technology has taken over that process here with a machine that works on each bore automatically. The guys at boring, We'll leave three to five thousandths in the block because borings are ragged, jagged, tearing of metal, and the rings, of course, would hate that. And so we go in and we hone, and we take that jagged metal out and get down to base parent stock. And in doing that, then we put in the right size, we get size down to plus or minus two tenths, we hold zero, and the right cross hatch because the cross hatch is wicks the oil up, which also is what puts the spin on the rings. They also align home the block's main saddle. If you control the size of the main saddle, the size of the crank, and the size of the rods, you control the oil pressure in the engine. After a thorough inspection, the heads get resurfaced and a three-angle valve job. And the crankshaft? It gets inspected. It gets ground. The specification on the crank today is uh, 
is a 8 to 12 roughness average. That's basically 12 millionths of an inch deep for the average scratch. With today's thin oils, we think that if you're over six, you're asking for trouble with little ferrite burrs. And so we spark out at the grinder, we polish, get ourselves down to about a 6RA, and the crank is ready to come up. Of course, for complete engine builds, there's an assembly room where one man builds one engine before putting his name on it. And then it moves on for a run test that ensures the oiling is right on the money. Our 235 components are obviously in good hands. The day I quit learning something new in this thing, I guess that's the time I retired. But right now, I still love doing it. Hard to imagine how many engines and blocks have been in and out of this place since 1967. Wow. Well, our stuff will be out of here after the break, and we'll start filling up that freshly machined block of our vintage Blue Flame 6. Stay right there. Hey, we're back. And so is the block, crank, head, and rods for trucks as old 235. Now we showed you some of the machining steps earlier, and anytime you get something back from the machine shop, you want to make sure to double check all the measurements like I'm doing with this crankshaft. Now believe it or not, all the 235 main journals were different sizes from the factory. For example, the back journal measures 2.745, and the front journal is a lot smaller than that. Look at the difference. Now our block was cast back in 1954, and you can't get bearings without tangs anymore for 54 and older 235s. So here's what we're going to do to make them fit. Be sure to remove the complete bearing tang. If you don't, it can take up real estate in the saddle, and when you tighten the mains down, you can lock the crank in place. Make sure to clean the bearing saddle and the back side of the bearing to remove any of that filing debris. Now for today's workout lifting this overweight crankshaft and dropping it in. We're using these nine and a half thousand shims to get the caps and bearings perfectly round in relationship to the crank journals. Plus, they'll help provide the bearing clearance we want for proper oiling. Now with the main cap cinched down, we can torque them to 100 foot-pounds. With a magnetic base and dial indicator mounted to the block, we can check the thrust, which should be between three and nine thousandths. We're right at nine, which is fine. This plate bolts to the front of the block and houses the timing cover and lets the oil pan bolt to the bottom of it. But most importantly, it has this groove in the back that feeds oil to this squirter, which oils the timing set. And that oil comes from the front cam journal. This plate also gives proper clearance to our new hydraulic flat tappet camshaft. Now it's got more lift than the one that came out and we got it from a company called Chevs of the 40s. They were also the source for the timing set, which has a steel crank gear but has an aluminum cam gear. The stuff you learn when you tear down an old engine. Who'd have thought that over 55 years ago they were using a lightweight fiber material for the camshaft's timing gear? The idea was to reduce noise, but were they tough? Well, this one broke when we tried to pull it off the cam. The mainstream use of aluminum in production engines back then was still in its infancy. The old pistons had to be replaced with new ones that are 80 over. And using floating pins, we've hung them on the original rods and caps that were cut and resized at the machine shop. By the way, the compression ratio of the 235 is about 7 to 1. Here's our new hydraulic flat tappet lifter that we got from Chevs of the 40s to match our new camshaft. And here's the stock solid flat tappets we pulled out of the engine. Now these things are actually hollow and a little goofy looking, but make sure you keep them when you pull them out because they make great chess pieces. Now also notice how the new lifter is a little bit shorter. To accommodate that, we got a longer push rod. Chances are you saw three holes like this one next to our lifters. They're there to allow oil to drain from the lifter compartment down to the oil pan. Now during teardown, you might have also seen this little line in front of the lifters. It's actually an oil feed line, feeds oil from the main galley up to the top of the engine. Well, we took it off, blew air through it, so we thought we'd try to reuse it. Well, when we did, it was so brittle it broke, which is actually a good thing. Let me show you why. It's so caked with sludge that eventually it would stop the oil flow, and then, yep, engine failure. So we have to make our own line. All you have to do is use a marker and the old line as a template. And here's where the engine stand can substitute for a tube bender. Just got to take it slow to keep from putting a kink in the line. You will need the right tools to make double flares at both ends. We've got a kit from Matco to make ours. So now we got a 
good supply of oil to the top end, unrestricted. So our next step, well, we're gonna reinstall the cylinder head and show you a new old way to feed a 235. Stick around. Hey, welcome back. Well, it's official. The factory muscle car wars are back with Mustang, Camaro, Challenger battling it out to prove they've got the baddest factory hot rod. But you know something? There are some unconventional weapons in this war, too. Recently on this show, we played with a Mazda Speed 3 and discovered how this little pocket rocket could keep up with many Mustangs and Camaros. Now even the guy who drives to work in the corporate world can have his luxury and his performance with this fourth generation Ford Taurus SHO. Wait a minute, a Taurus? Yeah, this ain't your daddy's Taurus or your mommy's. Not with options like this slick luxury interior with a cool blend of leather, chrome, and carbon fiber. And the crowning glory, a twin turbo V6 rated at 365 horsepower. We'll flash back and compare this to the third generation SHO that only made 235 horsepower with no manual trans option. Performance is also about handling. And with all-wheel drive, this SHO is super responsive. And while the power is no match for the Mustang, hey, there's plenty when you punch it. So, do we leave well enough alone? Hey, are you kidding? You know us. Now, we got some plans for this SHO, but since it belongs to Dub Magazine, we'll put them on the spot to help us out. Dub has a young, hip readership of guys who like to have fun with their rides and give them unique personalities that truly pop. Oh, that's part of the magazine too. And as always, rims rule. The Dub Magazine is an automotive lifestyle magazine that profiles artists, professional athletes, celebrities, entertainers, and their vehicles. So kind of like a snapshot into their life. What, what cars are they driving? What type of maybe tattoos do they have? What type of jewelry, jewelry are they wearing? maybe their outfits, you know, what they're doing now in the music industry. And uh, we really try to focus on how they give back and what they're doing for their communities now that they're successful. The guys at Dub came up with the paint scheme, adding flat black to the stock gray. They also installed the TIF mesh grill that's a huge styling change from what the factory provides. Of course, it wouldn't be a Dub car without a killer sound system. We've got a couple of performance upgrades of our own though, like removing the stock air intake, which comes out in no time, and replacing it with an Air Raid MXP system to allow more air into that already stout twin turbo V6. We've also got a Magnaflow catback kit to help it exhale better. Now it first requires cutting both factory inlet pipes four and three quarter inches behind the cats. Then using clamps from the kit, installed the inlet muffler assembly. All tubing is two and a half inches, including the mid pipes, and they lead to a pair of wide open deep tone mufflers. They're finished off with four inch double walled poly stainless tip. Now, if you think bigger is better, even for rollers, well, you gotta love this, 24 inch two piece wheels from TIS. <laughs> you don't need 2020 vision to see the difference. So would you call this SHO an executive hot rod? Well, one thing's for sure, with a hot ride like this, no executive is ever going to miss a meeting. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. It came out of the Trucks Guys Classics pickup, Got a thorough tear down in our shop before a visit to Groom's Engines for machining. Then it came back here for the rebuild where we just finished the bottom end. It, of course, is an inline six 235 that was cast back in 1954 for a Chevy truck. Originally with mechanical lifters, we just converted ours to hydraulic. Now this cast iron head, which weighs about a ton, is notorious for developing cracks and I'm afraid ours was no exception. After magnafluxing at the machine shop, three small cracks were discovered, all in the combustion chambers. 
So they sent it to a shop up in Indiana where the repair process begins by drilling two small holes on both ends of the crack. Now what that does is keep the crack from running on any further. Then they take and they bevel the whole line against the crack and fill it with weld. Now it's a timely process and you can't put too much heat to it or it starts to distort the head. Now once the welding's done, they take a burr and round it all off. Back at Grooms, it was rebuilt with new springs, valve guides, and seals. Finally, pressure check to make sure these new valves are seating properly. The head gasket for the 235 is bare metal on one side. Now they require the use of copper coat. Make sure not to get any in the cylinders. The cardboard, not included. Back then, the machine surface of the head had plenty of imperfections. There are lots of water jackets around the outer edge of the head, and the copper coat will help seal all of that and also prevent corrosion to the gasket. With the original bolts, we'll torque the head to 95 foot-pounds. Now we're ready to drop in our new push rods. Now they're solid, which means no oil passes through them to oil the rockers. So how do the rockers get lubricated? Well, it's by this coupler that ties the two rocker shafts together. The cylinder head has a hole in the top of it, which is an oil passage. The tube fits into it, oil comes into the coupler, and it's forced through the shafts. The rocker arms have another channel where the oil runs through to splash the tips. This setup came assembled from Pioneer. Now the rockers are non-roller, but adjustable. With our hydraulic lifters, we'll set them up at a half a turn past zero lash. Here's something kind of cool. We just learned about the intake exhaust setup of this 235. They share a common passage that has a heat riser valve attached to it. It's activated by a thermostatic spring. Now, when you fire up the engine cold, this valve is already open, allowing exhaust heat in to warm up the engine faster. After the engine runs a while, the spring, activated by heat again, closes, cutting off that supply of exhaust heat. As cool as that is, we're not going to use it anymore. It's time for us to focus on a real issue. This engine came with a single carburetor mounted right here to feed all six cylinders. By the time the fuel mixture reached the outers, it was in a lean condition. So we're using this Offenhauser intake that houses two single barrels, and it'll distribute the fuel evenly all the way across the board. All that gas will come from these refurbished single barrel Rochester carbs. Now they're getting pretty rare, and you can tell that by the core charges. A little pre-oiling is always a smart move on any fresh build, especially before the valve cover goes on, which often houses are made to match that intake. These last few replacement parts means we're done with this build. One last oddity, this dirt bike exhaust is really for the crankcase evac, right to the ground. This little engine was a blast to build. Don't be afraid to get out and tackle one of these old antique workhorses. This one's been around for 55 years, and it's probably got another 50 left in it. Now, the next time you'll see it, Kevin and Ryan will be stuffing it into their project truck and firing it up. That's if I give it back to them. We'll see you next week.